everybody and welcome to my first craft and crime video. I'm new to this so please be patient with me as I figure everything out. Don't really know what I'm doing but you know we'll get there. I decided to kick off this series with some pride crafts that I got on clearance from Michaels. What I went in for was a small bottle of white paint and what I left with was most of aisles three four and five. I'm sure that any other crafter out there can relate to this. You know, some women buy shoes. I buy craft items that are too pretty to use. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sure I'm not the only person who has this problem. And just so you know, I'm the proud parent of a gender fluid kid. I'm sure I'll end up referencing them many times. And that's also why I tend to gravitate towards a lot of pride crafts. So if that's something that you're not into, then these videos probably aren't gonna be for you and that's okay but I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. And I should also give everybody fair warning that, you know, these videos are craft and crime. So that means that while you're watching my hands do some crafts with my wonky thumbs and everything, I will be talking about a crime and that crime features a bad guy doing bad stuff. There is going to be content that sensitive listeners and younger audiences are probably going to find upsetting. So just wanted to give you a warning about that. You might want to tap out of this if there are little kids around or if that's not really your jam, then, you know, this video is probably not going to be for you. Okay, so we've got that out of the way. I want you to imagine that it's 1968. Now, I don't know how old you are. I don't know who's listening, but for me personally, I wasn't actually alive in 1968. So I had to do some research to like really get the imaginative juices flowing. So let me paint you a little picture. We got some short shorts going. We have some paisley and plaid action happening. We got some Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles. I mean, come on, come on. It's pretty awesome. Except, well, I don't know if you guys know about this. This was new to me. But there was this, like, crazy incident with North Korea and this Navy ship. You should look it up if you don't know about it. It's, it's crazy. There were, like, hostages and stuff. And it was, like, really, really stressful. And the two countries were really pissed at each other for a long time. And it was just insane. You should look it up. And then... That was also the year that Martin Luther King was assassinated. So, you know, student activism was a huge thing as well. Students were protesting the Vietnam War. Lots of movies have done reenactments of this. So, yeah, there was a lot of unrest happening at schools. Actually, at Columbia University, these protests went on and on and on. They went on for like a week straight and eventually... The New York City Police Department had to come in and break it up, and it got quite violent. Uh, the police department ended up beating and arresting hundreds of protesters. Now, in light of 2020, I kind of want to make some snarky comments here about the parallels between protesters in 1968 and what we saw last year in 2020, but this is my first video, so maybe I'll just sort of hold back on the snark. But yeah, 1968, like, kind of a crazy year. Kind of crazy. So just a few weeks after that whole protesting mess, just to paint a little bit more of a picture, Robert F. Kennedy, well, he done got himself assassinated. Because the year, it just hadn't been eventful enough. The majority of the country proved they were excellent decision makers. And they voted for Richard Nixon that November making him the incoming president. I mean, yeah, that year was a lot. It was a lot. So maybe it's good that we just focus on the Paisley and the plaid and the Beatles, because good Lord, the rest of the year was kind of a crazy mofo. I mean, Steppenwolf was singing Born to be Wild and wow, they were not joking. It was born to be a hot mess, I think, is more accurate, but hey, they didn't ask for my opinion because, oh yeah, I wasn't born yet. So that's 1968 in a nutshell. And yeah, I should 
probably have mentioned this already, but homosexuality was not legal in America. I mean, it wasn't legal in a lot of countries, but the story I'm going to tell takes place in the States, so yeah. Okay, ready? Because we're really going to get into it now. Imagine yourself among the Paisley and the plaid, among the homophobia, as a 22-year-old guy at his favorite club. And oh yeah, you just happen to be gay. And oh yeah, your favorite club just happens to be a gay club, because that's where all the hotties hang out. Now, truth be told, sometimes you gotta hustle to make some cash. It's not your favorite thing to do, and you're not proud of it. But you gotta do what you gotta do to survive. And you've been pretty lucky with it so far, so it is what it is. So then this older guy comes up to you and offers you 50 bucks to drink a pint of vodka. And you're like, what is this? Is this guy serious? Really? And the guy says, uh, yeah, I'm serious. Like, I'm part of this research team and I'm studying the effects of alcohol. Why would I lie to you about this? So you look around. The club is full of people and most of them are your age. This guy is older. He kind of stands out and his suit looks really expensive and professional. Like he doesn't fit in here. So yeah, he seems legit. Like why would he lie to you? I mean, the whole thing seems kind of weird, but come on, the man says. He pulls out a notebook. This would really help him a lot. So you think, okay, what the hell? I've done a lot worse for 50 bucks. You reach out for the drink, and as you do, you feel a hand lightly rest on yours. You look up, and you see the bartender. He's giving you this really subtle shake of his head, and, and you're confused. Like, dude, don't you want to sell more drinks? What are you doing? The older man beside you, he's getting fed up, and he grabs the vodka, and he presses it into your hand. Drink up, he says. You look over to the bartender just to double check that you saw what you thought you saw, but he's taking an order from someone else now and he's ignoring you. So you're like, that's so weird. Maybe, maybe I'm just being paranoid. I don't even know what I saw. Maybe I didn't see anything. I'm probably just wigging out over nothing. So, okay, you just grab the drink and you tip back the vodka and you enjoy the music. And then you black out. So this is your introduction to the story of the handcuffed man, Robert Lee Bennett Jr. We do not like Robert Lee Bennett Jr. He is not a good guy. He's what high-minded scholars would call a polluted ass monkey. He's what people on the street call seriously effed up. So often when one of Bennett's victims woke up, if they woke up, because not all of them did, they would find themselves handcuffed. Their genitals and sometimes their legs had been burned. And when I say burned, I mean he would dump flammable liquid on them and yeah was not awesome. Because it was 1968 and the law stated it was a crime to be a homosexual, victims were very hesitant to come forward. I mean, most of these young men were sex workers and to add homosexuality to the mix, you can see why they didn't feel the crime would be given the highest priority in 1968. I found this really good article by Mary T. Schmidt, 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 I'm not sure how to say her name. Anyway, it's a great article from the Chicago Tribune, dated August 3rd, 1991. In it, she quotes Kathy Willard, who is a past member of Atlanta's Gay and Lesbian Police Advisory Committee. She said, It doesn't seem to matter that much of someone is savagely burning male hustlers because they're not the cream of the crop. That's horrible. 
Let me be clear. I'm not blaming the police here. I'm just looking back at a period of time and saying, wow, that's sad that people couldn't look at each other and value human life equally. What a weird caste system to feel that certain people are just toss away. And whether the police officers actually felt that way, and we'll get to that, to a certain extent, doesn't matter. The societal view towards homosexuality was so negative that often people wouldn't come out to their families. So the victims in this crime, Bennett's victims, a lot of them wouldn't go to the police because that would mean that they'd have to admit their sexual orientation, not only to the cops, but they'd risk having their families find out and maybe not be accepted by them. So they had to suffer from the physical and mental trauma alone and cope with it on their own. It's so awful. So, okay, let's go back to the beginning. Who is this Robert Lee Bennett guy? Oh, he probably grew up without a mom and he had a survivalist dad who gave him a can of dog food and a rusty spoon and told him to fend for himself, right? Well, not really. Okay, he was adopted at 22 months old, and from what I can gather, nobody really knows much about what went on before his adoption. But the people who adopted him were awesome. The dad, Robert Bennett, he was a successful lawyer who did a bunch of fundraising for the Boy Scouts. And the mom, Annabelle, she volunteered for the Red Cross when she wasn't busy being a homemaker and a full-time mom to Robert Jr. They both doted on their adopted son. Robert Jr. had a paper route at one point, and if the weather sucked, Robert Sr. would drive him around in his Cadillac to deliver the newspapers. I remember helping my friend Nikki with her paper route in the sixth grade, and it started to rain and her parents didn't show up to help us. We just got soaked and it was tough nuggies for us, so it seems like Robert Jr. had a pretty sweet deal going on there. Robert Jr. wasn't much of a sports guy as he got older but was part of the Glee Club and the Science Club and the features editor of the school newspaper. Basically, he was ticking all the boxes of my personal high school must-have list, which I suppose isn't saying much about my teenage tastes and guys. And just in case I hadn't been clear about the privilege he grew up in, when he graduated from high school, his parents bought him a house. Yeah, a freaking house! When I graduated from high school, I think maybe we went out for dinner. It was like 82 years ago when I graduated from high school, so I don't really remember, but I know for a fact my parents didn't buy me a freaking house. Did your parents buy you a house? Like, whose parents buy them a freaking house because they graduated high school? That's ridiculous. My God. So after this, he went on to study political science at the University of Denver, where he got a master's degree. But uh uh-oh, he had a whoopsie-daisy while he was there, and he got charged with indecent exposure. Oh, no. Those records have been expunged because sure they have been. It's pretty gross, though. Okay, that charge was in 1971. In 1974, Bennett got his law degree. I mean, I guess intellectually... He wasn't stupid. He had a master's degree and he had a law degree. If only universities could teach him not to be a total nerd wanger, but anyway. In 1974, he got his law degree, started working for his dad, and got in total crap with the Atlanta police for kidnapping an undercover police officer. Yeah, you heard that. The officer was posing as a street hustler, And I guess Bennett was like, dude, I'm going to get me some of that. And had already been thinking about the stuff he'd be doing later on. Luckily for the police officer, he was soon rescued and he didn't actually come to any harm. Of course, Bennett hired a fancy lawyer. And by the time his trial rolled around, the kidnapping charges had been dropped. His lawyer finagled a deal where Bennett pled to an offense of simple battery. And he only ended up paying a $75 fine. I mean, there are no words for this. Well, okay, there are words. Like, douche canoe. That's a word. Can I say that on YouTube? I don't know. I guess I'll find out if I can say that. I'm brand new to this. I don't know what I'm allowed to say. But, like, a lot of the words that are coming to my mind 
are words that I feel like I'll get in trouble if I say on YouTube, so I, I think I'm just going to stick to the script that I've written here because I really feel like I'm going to get in trouble. Bennett just kept right on being his awesome self and getting in more trouble in 1976. This is when I think the pattern with him really starts. So this young, haughty New Yorker was in Pennsylvania, traveling around, doing his do, and he meets up with Robert. Robert pays the guy to have a drink, and they end up having sex in his car. Cool. Car sex. All good so far. Remember that sweet house Robert got as a graduation gift? So they decide that they're going to go there. At some point, the young New Yorker gets all freaked out. I mean, I personally can't imagine why. I'm sure everything Robert said during the car ride was perfectly rational and totally normal and not at all creepy or weird or, like, murdery at all. I'm totally sure of it. But for whatever reason, the guy gets all freaked out. And so he grabs Bennett's keys and jumps in the car and takes off without him. Like, he just freaking bolts. And then he crashes the car. So this makes me wonder, was the drink spiked? Is that why he got freaked out? Did he, like, feel really off and know something wasn't right? And he needed to get out of there right away? It's very sus, people. It's very sus. The whole situation is totally sus. In any case, he wasn't very interested in talking to the police, probably because he'd accepted money for the drink and the sex, and another officer was noping out of the situation, too. I've got a quote from Murderpedia.org where it says another officer discouraged the alleged victim from pushing an investigation. By 1977, Bennett was working at an Atlanta law firm because apparently he just lands on his feet all the time. And he was also hanging out at Piedmont Park, which was an area where the gay guys hung out. He'd already begun to get a bad reputation there with all the experienced hustlers who had nicknamed him the Handcuff Man. His M.O. hadn't changed much at all. He would lure in a younger guy with spiked drinks. Classic. Gross. Around this time, Bennett decided he should start dating the secretary at his office because apparently he thought being a cliché was a super cool thing to do. Sandra Powell was five years his junior, and when he proposed to her, he told her that he was impotent. And he said, look, we're going to have an incomplete marriage. Like, she seemed to be okay with it. Psst, Sandra. What he means by that is he actually likes the D. I don't think she realized what he meant by impotent. But, I mean, she went along with the marriage. Apparently he was quite intelligent and he could be funny. So she figured, yeah, okay, that's good enough for me. Oh, Sandra, I wish you'd set higher standards for yourself. So after they got married, Bennett decided, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be a lawyer anymore. I think I'm just going to go sell some jewelry at the local shopping mall. And then after he got that job, he was like, yeah, no, I, I don't think I'm going to do that either. I think I'm just going to nope right out of this whole working situation. And he just stopped going. Now, I can only speak for myself, but if I was a newlywed going around to my friends being all like, I landed myself a lawyer. <laughs> I take that Barbara who said I'd never meet anybody. And then my new husband just up and quit his job to go work at freaking K Jewelers. I would not be impressed. No, no. I hope my real life husband is listening to this because, hey man, 
You better be going to work and not listening to this in a coffee shop. I mean, it's work hours. You should be at work, working, doing work stuff. Don't be bailing on your job, dude. Okay, anyway. By this point, Bennett's dad had died and left all kinds of money. So they were pretty loaded. It's not like Bennett had to go to work for the money. They were, they were doing just fine. It was more that Sandra would leave for work in the morning with Bennett just lazing around the house in his robe. And then when she came home, there he would be, still in his robe, still doing nothing, lazing around the house, which was always a mess. Sometimes he'd do some gardening, or sometimes he'd paint some landscapes. Okay, so I have to take a minute, and I'm a pretty serious crafter, so I feel like I need to defend myself a little bit here and say there's nothing wrong with spending the day crafting or painting or anything, but like, I still manage to take a shower and empty the dishwasher and, you know, like, function like a normal human being. Then it just sounded really douchey, you know, and like, not awesome. And really, he was just primarily focusing on his other hobby, which was, of course, the hobby that his wife didn't know about, which was the torture. Yeah. So the marriage would end in 1982. Earlier in the year, unknown to Sandra, a young man named Cleveland Bubb was attacked. Now, I gotta say, I love this guy's name. I'm not gonna lie. It's just the best name. I think it's awesome. I'm going to read directly from the Murderpedia article because they just have the best phrasing of this entire thing. Okay, this is from Murderpedia. A man in a blue car drove up to Bub. Would you drink a bottle of vodka with me, he asked. I'll give you $100 to do it. Bub got in the car and the two men drank together. The man wore expensive clothes but seemed a bit sloppy. He had a gold chain around his neck, and the first few buttons of his shirt was open. The pair also went to a bar called the Texas Drilling Company and downed a few. The next thing Bub remembers is waking up in the parking lot. He wore only his parachute pants and had two cigarette burns, one on his belly and the other on his arm. Later, Bub would say that he wanted to take a bottle and break it over his attacker's fucking head. He wore expensive clothes, but was sloppy, with a gold chain and buttons of his shirt undone. Why? Why am I just picturing lots and lots of chest hair all over the place, with like a big, thick gold chain just like sprawled across a big oily chest? It's just so gross, but that's all I can picture. And I'm also picturing Bennett wearing these oversized aviators that are just really, really disgusting. He's just such a skis. I hate him so much. I hate him so, so much. Later that year, Sandra was walking home from a bus stop when she sees Bennett handcuffed and being led from their home from uniformed police officers. So I read this and I'm like, yes, finally! And so she's looking at this and she's like, what in the royal furball is happening? And he's all like, I don't know. Nobody's telling me anything. I totally don't get it. What a freaking idiot. He totally knew what was going on. He totally knew. Bennett was charged with the murder of James Lee Johnson, a 24-year-old dishwasher. Sadly, the charges were dropped two months later due to insufficient evidence because of course they were but she's like no I'm out I'm out forget it screw you and your limpness nope I'm done I'm gonna go get me some somewhere else I want a divorce Bennett contested the divorce because he was just petty and he didn't want to give her any money. And to be honest, she was asking for a lot for the time. Well, you know what, buddy? Maybe if you hadn't left your super amazing job as the jewelry guy at the mall, you wouldn't feel so bad about paying her now, would you? Oh, what a douche. Three gay male sex workers testified at the divorce trial that they believed Bennett was the handcuffed man 
And I think these guys deserve all the trophies and all the ice cream. It was really brave and amazing of them for standing up and being willing to testify. It's pretty rad when you consider the time period that they were in. It was 1982, and being gay was finally legal in most states, but it still wasn't a super cool thing to admit. So, I mean, I think they're straight up legends. Like, that's, that's pretty awesome. Bennett kept on making friends everywhere he went. For example, a male sex worker complained to Sergeant J.D. Kirkland that Bennett had a reputation for picking up hustlers and injuring them. This resulted in Bennett being banned from Gallus, a mostly gay bar in Atlanta. In 1984, a young man named Myers von Hirschsprung, which is another stellar name, like I don't know what it is with this case, but they're just amazing names in this case. I feel like this guy should be killing intergalactic space aliens or something because his name is just like, it's just insane how good this name is. Okay, but anyway, Myers von Hirschsprung was hanging out near his home and a middle-aged guy asked him if he needed a ride. So Myers was like, yeah, I actually do need a ride. So he got in. It was just a simpler time. As they drove, the middle-aged dude starts yammering on and on about how he's a professor and he's doing this study on the effects of alcohol. And, you know, he'll give Myers $100 if he drinks whatever alcohol of his choosing and lets this guy watch him walk afterwards and see how the alcohol affects him. So Myers is watching him and he's like, yeah, nah, bro, I'm, I, I'm good. I, I don't need to participate in that. I like Myers. Myers knew instantly that this whole thing was like, not okay. He says to Bennett, please just let me out. Just let me out of the car. And the middle-aged guy who we know is Bennett, he actually did. He actually let Myers out of the car. So good on you, Myers. You're lucky. You got away. You got to use that awesome name in new and exciting ways for the rest of your life. Woohoo! In 1985, a guy named Chico was picked up by Bennett. This time, Bennett gave him some handcuffs and was like, Dude, you want to do me a solid and try these? Actually, I highly doubt that's what he said. He probably said something more like, Why don't you put these on? I want to know what you look like with them on. Or something like that. But Chico was like, Please stop the car. Please stop the car. And then Bennett goes, No. So it was 1985, and I don't know what music they were listening to, but I'm telling you, in that moment, if I were Chico, I would have had a flock of seagulls in my pants because I would have been terrified, especially when I noticed that the door lock had been removed and the handle had been duct taped. But Chico is a lot cooler than I am. What did Chico do? Yeah. Chico noticed that the window was open and he freaking dove out the window as the car was moving, like a boss. I can tell you that's not what I would have done. So Max Schrader, however, he was not so lucky. He was slim and he was handsome and he had tattooed forearms. He was out looking for some money in the spring of 1985 when he encountered Bennett. Bennett offered him some vodka to get the date started, and after drinking some, Schrader, he just immediately knew that it was laced with something. 
he actually fell to the ground and he was half unconscious and Bennett dragged him into the car, but he did manage to beg, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. And Bennett didn't listen, of course, because he's a douche. Bennett drove them to a secluded wooded area. Once they were alone, Bennett stripped the clothes off of Schrader and he poured this cold liquid all over his genitals. Okay, this is, this is really gross. A fire was lit on Schrader. And then Bennett just drove off. He's like, see ya. My work here is done. I'm out. Luckily, someone heard Schrader screaming. Well, I don't know if that's lucky, but someone heard Schrader screaming and called the police. Schrader spent months in the hospital, and he had to be heavily sedated for a lot of the time that he spent in the hospital. He was just in so much agony. Now, over time, there were other attacks, and in... 1986, Bennett got caught drugging and mugging men at yet another gay bar. He continued his crap right on to February 1991. Gary Clapp was a straight man with a fiancé and a daughter who was out of town for the night looking for work. He really, really needed to find a job. He needed to make some money. He was desperate for cash, and he encountered Bennett, and he fell for Bennett's drink trick. Bennett said, you want to make some money? I'm doing this research study. And Gary Clapp fell for it. So Gary Clapp ended up being burned so badly that night that both of his legs needed to be amputated above the knee. Clapp's fiance ended up leaving him. It was just, it was awful. Things were just a mess for him. But when the police came in with photos, he recognized Bennett right away as his attacker. He said that he couldn't believe that the police knew who it was so quick. Unfortunately, the police didn't catch Bennett right then. Slide on into May of 1991. A guy named Michael Jordan Jr. was found severely burned. Bennett rolled on up in his car and enticed Jordan to join him in the front seat and earn 50 bucks. We know the story. We know what happens. Bennett dropped him unconscious behind an Atlanta hotel. He'd been burned on his genitals, buttocks, and legs. Also in May... Matthew Vernon was approached by Bennett because apparently Bennett just couldn't get enough of being a creepy maggot and he had to keep on going back for more. But as they drove around, Vernon actually figured out who Bennett was. He actually managed to coerce Bennett into giving him another $20 before taking the next drink. And once Bennett gave him the money, he managed to jump out of the car and he said, I know who you are. You're the handcuff man. Once he was safely on the sidewalk, Vernon stuck a finger down his throat and he threw up all the vodka that he'd already had. So he ended up being okay. Thank goodness. By now, Jordan, he was the guy who was dumped behind the hotel. He'd managed to have an interview with the police. And he had also picked out Bennett's picture out of a photo lineup and he didn't have any trouble doing it. Max Schrader, who had been attacked five years earlier, he spoke to the police and he also picked out Bennett's picture from a photo lineup. So things were really starting to close in on Bennett. I think that's where we're going to leave it for today. The story gets really good. So I hope you guys come back for part two. And thanks so much for checking out my first YouTube video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to leave me a comment. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.